The Peter Schiff Show. Today's podcast is sponsored by NetSuite, the easy-to-use cloud-based business management software for every aspect of your business. Take advantage of NetSuite's special financing offer at netsuite.com slash gold. Today's podcast is also sponsored by OxyHelp, the leading European-based manufacturer of premium monoplace and multi-place hard shell hyperbaric oxygen chambers. If you want to live a longer and healthier life, go to oxyhelp.com and tell them that you were referred by Peter Schiff and you'll get 10% off on any chamber that you buy. Welcome to another live Peter Schiff Show podcast. And I want to remind everybody once again, give me the thumbs up, whether you like this podcast or not. Say that you like it, uh, um, comment on it, and subscribe to my YouTube channel if you're not currently a subscriber. You know, you guys slacked off a bit uh, last podcast. You still did good. I think we have 11 or 12,000 likes, uh, or, but it's a little bit fewer than we had in the podcast before with the same amount of views. So step it up. If you, uh, if you forgot to hit that like button uh, last time, make sure and, and hit it this time. Well, the financial crisis that I believe we're already in, now this is, of course, the early stages of that financial crisis. It is unfolding uh, before your eyes if you're awake or smart enough to recognize what you see. But it's going to get a lot worse. At some point, people are going to realize that we're in a financial crisis, although they're not going to realize why. <laughs> you know, they're, they're all going to be just as blindsided by this financial crisis as they were by the much smaller financial crisis in 2008 that also took them by complete surprise. And if you remember back then, they were describing the crisis as, you know, a 100-year flood you know, nobody could have possibly predicted this, right? I mean, this was a confluence of events. You know, this was a, a crazy black swan that, you know, nobody could have uh, foreseen, which, of course, was all a bunch of BS because a number of people, myself included, not only saw it in advance, but spent years uh, warning about it. I mean, I wrote a book about it. Uh, so the signs were there. You just had to <coughs> be cognizant of them. And you had to, you know, read them. It wasn't even like they were uh, written in Chinese or something. It was pretty clear uh, what was about to happen. And, you know, the same thing this time. In fact, I think it's even more clear. I mean, this is the most obvious financial crisis that nobody sees coming. I mean, this isn't even a black swan. I mean, this isn't even a white swan. This is like, this is like a pigeon. They're, they're everywhere, right? I mean, this is a very common bird. Uh, that, you know, is not coming out of left field. It's just, you know, it's, it's right there, right? I mean, uh, but, you know, Wall Street uh, has a, a big vested interest in ignoring this, and so does uh, uh, a lot of people on Main Street. So does academia, uh, the financial media, the government. Nobody wants to uh, acknowledge this until, of course, it already happens. Then they have to figure out who the scapegoat is. But whoever they end up blaming it on, the solution is always, well, we just need more government, right? They never look back and reflect on government's role in creating the crisis. No, no, no. They're, they're too busy pointing fingers at somebody in the private sector and, and, and holding out government as the salvation. We just need more government. If we only had more regulations, then this wouldn't have happened. No, it happened because we had too many regulations. What we need is free market regulations. Those are the ones that work. Government regulations don't, and not only don't they work, but they sabotage the free market regulations that actually do work. Now, what was going on this week in the market was a continuation of the rise in long-term bond yields. As I've been predicting on this program uh, since before the rise began, this is relentless. And during the week, Yesterday, in fact, and maybe early this morning, bond yields hit new highs. The yield on a 30-year Treasury was now not only over 5%, but over 5.1%. In fact, the high intraday this morning was 
0.44%. Now, we did get some profit-taking, I guess, people who had shorted bonds, and they made a lot of money this week, uh, short bonds. They covered, I guess, into the week, and there was a rally, not a big rally, uh, but bonds recovered those losses, <clears throat> and the yield on a 30-year closed at 5 spot 0 8 nine percent this is again the highest weekly close and that would have been the highest close you know going back to 2007 since yesterday uh, so yields are moving higher the yield on a 10-year momentarily got above five percent as well intraday just barely before buyers stepped up and the yield backed off to 5.089 but still another backup on the week in fact, the only maturities now on the yield curve that are below 5% are the five-year and the 10-year. The five-year is 4.862. But a three-month, a six-month, a two-year, uh, they're all above 5%. And um, the 30-year is above 5%. The yield curve is pretty flat around that 5% uh, number. But it's not going to stay flat. It's going to steepen out. I expect long-term interest rates to continue the march upward, and we should put more distance between a 90-day, six-month Treasury bill and a 10 to 30-year Treasury bond, especially the 30-year bond. I mean, that one is going to take the biggest hit. But I think that if this yield curve normalizes by the end of next year, I think that the short rates, which are now around five and a half, they may move up closer to six, but at the same time, the longer end, the 10 to 30 year, that's going to move up to seven to eight at a minimum. Now, the question is, will the Fed allow that to happen? Will the financial markets, will the banking sector, uh, will the economy, will the government be able to withstand that increase? I mean, so far, it seems like Okay, you know, we're surviving 5%, although I don't really think we are. Again, I think the numbers belie the problems that underline the economy. First of all, we got the leading economic indicators that came out yesterday, and they came out negative again for the 16th consecutive month. Now, I mean, that's pretty rare. I mean, you have to go back to 2007, 2008 which was the Great Recession, right? The worst recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. So you got to go back there to find a string of negative uh, leading economic indicators that's longer than the 16 months we got now. And in fact, it was worse than expected. They were looking for a minus 0.4, and we got minus 0.7 which was way worse than any expectations, that the range of expectations was from minus 0.2 to minus 0.5, and we were minus 0.7. And to add insult to injury, we revised down the previous negative month from negative 0.4 to negative 0.5. So the economy is a lot weaker then the experts are telling us. That's what the leading economic indicators are saying. I mean, if the economy is so strong, how can these leading economic indicators be so weak? to rally. But the bigger banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and a lot of the regional banks just got clobbered. But uh, American Express was leading the decline, down 5.4%. They reported earnings. And, and they're just reporting just the early stages of problem. But anybody who was loaning out money during the bubble is going to have a problem getting the money back as the bubble deflates. So this is just the tip of a big iceberg for American Express, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, you know, all these uh, credit card companies, because there's going to be a wave of credit card defaults. I mean, we already have record credit card interest rates, over 20%. At the same time, we have record 
uh, credit card balances? How can the consumer afford to pay record high rates on a record high amount of debt? He can't, especially since he's paying more for food, uh, energy, insurance, health care, you name it. It's more expensive. And, and so these, uh, these defaults are coming. But the economy is weak. Look, look at the solar panel. There was this solar stock uh, that was down. Uh, solar Bridge Technologies reported bear earnings down 27% on the day. Uh, new 52-week low. That stock is now 76% below. It's 52-week high. Obviously, Americans can't afford to buy solar panels. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, that, that's a big upfront cost. Uh, in order to put those things on. Uh, so any kind of discretionary purchase, a big ticket, there's just no way. I mean, maybe people were financing these things before with cheap credit, but that's not available anymore, so they can't buy. Right? If, if consumers can't borrow, they can't buy. That's why housing uh, sales are collapsing. Uh, autos, anything that requires debt to buy is out of reach. Uh, for most Americans. Anyway, we got a quick commercial. I got a lot more to talk about, so stick around. We'll be right back. Your business was humming, but now you're falling behind. Teams buried in manual work, taking forever to close the books. Getting one source of truth is like pulling teeth. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have already upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less. Close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get customized solutions for all your KPIs, key performance indicators, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, and it's all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you constantly excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash gold that's netsuite.com slash gold to get your own kpi checklist netsuite.com slash gold another indicator of the underlying weakness of the u.s economy is the weakening fiscal position of the u.s government because remember if times are good then more people are paying more taxes <clears throat> because they're earning more money and fewer people are drawing on government benefits because they don't need them because things are great. <clears throat> but the fiscal position of the United States continues to deteriorate. We got the numbers actually end for the government's reporting. And first of all, the budget deficit in September came out at twice what they expected. They expected $85.5 billion of red ink during the month. And instead, we got $170.9 billion. So higher than the, the worst estimate, but double what they expected. And for the entire year, the official budget deficit was $1.7 trillion. That's what Congress claimed the deficit was. But of course, I don't look at what Congress claims the, the deficits were. I just look at the increase in the national debt because that's a more honest number because the national debt actually includes everything that the government borrowed. The official budget only includes what they borrowed to pay for on budget items. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? If something is not on the budget and the government pays for it, they don't count it. So, for example, if there's a, uh, you know, a national disaster, natural disaster, and the government has relief for that natural disaster, and let's say that's, you know, $50 billion that they have to spend for disaster aid, they don't actually count the money that they borrowed to pay for that disaster relief as part of the budget deficit because they say, well, you know, we, it, it wasn't budgeted for. We didn't plan on it. It was unexpected. So we're going to pretend that we didn't pay that money. Can you imagine, you know, families you know, ran their household like that? They's like, well, if there's an unexpected expense, we'll just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. I mean, you got to pay it. And in fact, they did pay it. They borrowed the money to do it. 
So all of the stuff that's off budget still requires debt to finance it. And so the national debt still goes up, whether the government planned on spending the money or not. I mean, it doesn't matter what they intended to do. What matters is what they actually did. And so during the fiscal year, where the official budget deficit was $1.7 trillion, the actual national debt rose by better than uh, $2 trillion. And it, it could have been closer to $2.5 trillion because in the first week or two of uh, October, the national debt jumped by $500 billion, like half a trillion in, in a couple of weeks. Now, some of that spending really probably happened you know, in uh, the prior fiscal year. So maybe the national debt actually increased closer to $2.5 trillion during the same time period where the government officially acknowledged or claimed that the national debt rose by $1.7 trillion, which is still a huge number. <laughs> but it was actually much bigger than that if you just look at the national debt. And that is part of the problem. That is this fiscal time bomb that is in the process of exploding. Because as the size of the national debt is skyrocketing, the interest that we have to pay on the national debt is skyrocketing too. The rates are going up. So the amount of debt that we have to finance is going up and the interest that we have to pay to finance it is going up. And in fact, it's a compounding situation because we have to borrow the money to pay that interest. Remember, every nickel that the government pays in interest on the debt, it has to borrow. <laughs> and all that additional borrowing adds to the national debt, which then has to be financed at a higher rate, right? This, this whole thing is in the process of imploding. That's the point that I'm making and the point that everybody is ignoring, including uh, the Federal Reserve. And I want to talk about yesterday's uh, speech that uh, Jerome Powell gave in front of the Economic Club of New York, right? So, and I think I've spoken at the Economic Club in New York at some point in the past, you know. Um, and, you know, if they really want to know what's going on in the economy or what's likely to happen in the future, that they, they ought to bring me back. I mean, forget about Powell. I mean, I mean, he's comic relief. I mean, they're, they're, he doesn't know what's going on. I mean, if he does, he's not going to be honest. He's going to lie. But, you know, he probably doesn't know. He's just clueless. Uh, and, and he lies on top of that. But if they want honest answers and, and actual legitimate, accurate answers, you know, I'm happy to come back and set the record straight. In fact, they should ask me every single question that they asked uh, Jerome Powell, because my answer would pretty much be the opposite <laughs> of his answer. But of course, my answers would be accurate and would actually, you know, have value. Uh, you know, in, in fact, I'm sure that most of the members of the Economic Club of New York, maybe all the members, know more e about economics than Jerome Powell, right? Because you have to flunk a tech test about economics in order to qualify to be chairman of the Federal Reserve. In fact, you probably can't even get to be a Federal op Open Market Committee member if you actually know anything about economics, right? So they have to make sure uh, that you flunk all these exams before they even allow you uh, to, to be a member of the Fed. You know, people think these guys you know, are the smartest of all of us, right? That's why they're there because, you know, they're so super smart. And it's a good thing we have these, you know, geniuses, uh, you know, at the Fed, you know, because all of us simpletons, you know, we, we can never survive. You know, we need their omnipotence, right? So they can divine uh, exactly what the interest rate needs to be, right? Or what the inflation rate needs to be. And just, you know, magically, uh, you know, get everything to come out perfectly, which, you know, hopefully at the end of this, all these uh, people at the Fed, will be completely discredited. But I want to go over some of the more ridiculous things that he said. And I'm just going to go back to my own uh, Twitter account because I was watching this stuff and I was tweeting out a bunch of stuff. And then I rewatched it again, you know, because I was distracted when I was watching it live. And I rewatched it later on that day. And then I tweeted out a bunch of, you know, more comments. I'm just going to go through them because this is going to remind me of uh, what I want to talk about. But, you know, by the way, speaking about my Twitter account, if you're not following me on Twitter, follow me. At the end of this podcast, just, or, you know, just follow me on Twitter. I, I'm now less than 25,000 
followers from a million. And that's a big milestone. I mean, reaching a million Twitter followers isn't, isn't uh, uh, easy. It's taken me a while. But the interesting thing about my Twitter followers is they're all organic. They're all real. There's no bots, really, that are following. Maybe there's a few of them. But I've never advertised, I've never purchased a, a Twitter follower. You know, I go to, like, the, the uh, Wall Street Journal t- Twitter page. And they got 25 million followers, 25 million. So 25 times the number of people who are following me. Yet, if you look at their tweets, and they they tweet even more than I do. I mean, it's like they're nonstop tweeting over there at the Wall Street Journal. But nobody's reading these tweets. If you look at their engagement, you look at their, you know, their likes, their comments, their shares, they're all like double digits. Some of them are single digits. Then you look at my tweets. I mean, none of them are below triple digits. A lot of times they're quadruple digits in um, in likes or, or shares or comments. So they have uh, 20, 25 times the number of followers I have, but I have like 100 times the engagement they have. So if you adjust it for followers, I mean, nobody is paying any attention. Why are these people even following? I mean, I have a feeling that a lot of these followers which is purchased, you know, so that the Wall Street Journal could look good. But also, I do think that people like to follow the Wall Street Journal. What they are to everybody else who who goes to their to their Twitter page, right? But I don't follow them, right? I, I don't have to pretend I'm smart and, I, and follow the Wall Street Journal because if I just read the Wall Street Journal, I probably wouldn't know nearly as much as I do because I would be just as blind a, as everybody else. But anyway, let me get back. So just go ahead and help me get to a million organic, natural uh, Twitter followers. Uh, and if you're following me, you don't need to follow the Wall Street Journal. So if you are following them, just unfollow them, right? It's a waste of a follow. Anyway, so here's the, my first um, observation. So one of the things that Powell said is he said, we need to weaken economic growth because he wants to lower inflation. And so he's looking at the economy and he said, oh, you know, it's just too strong. We didn't realize it could be so strong. We need it to weaken a little bit because that's what's going to bring inflation down. Again, complete fallacy. It's a Keynesian myth that uh, economic growth causes inflation. And I am going to continue to expose expose that myth and talk more about what Powell said uh, to uh, the Economic Club of New York on the other side of this commercial break. So stick around. I turned 60 years old this year. And once you get to the big 6-0, you really start thinking about your own mortality. And one of the things that I found is that an important component is the length of your telomeres. And what I started to do is a lot of research on longevity. Studies have shown that telomere length is directly linked to longevity, as well as your overall health and wellness. Telomeres are at the end of your chromosomes, and they protect the information those chromosomes contain. Your cells are constantly dividing, and new healthier cells are born to replace the older cells that are dying out. But once the telomeres get too short, the cells can no longer divide, and they just die off. The result is that your body begins to deteriorate. In other words, you age and you eventually die. One way that you can lengthen your telomeres is by intermittent fasting. And I've been doing that for over a year. But I also found that hyperbaric oxygen therapy has also been proven to substantially lengthen your telomeres. The concept is you breathe pure oxygen under pressure, and that puts more oxygen into your lungs that go directly into your cells. And by heavily oxidating your cells, studies found that it actually lengthens your telomeres and hopefully extends your lifespan. In addition to the promotion of longevity, studies demonstrate that hyperbaric oxygen therapy boosts the cognitive 
cognitive functions of your brain, especially in terms of multitasking and memory. I did an extensive amount of research before I selected OxyHelp. And because hyperbaric oxygen therapy requires a significant time commitment to really work, I selected a multi-place chamber, which allows me to bring my cell phone and my laptop into the chamber while I'm doing the therapy so I don't have any downtime. So I can work and lengthen my telomeres at the same time. And if I run out of work, I can lie down and take a nap or just watch the television that's mounted on the interior wall. So go to oxyhelp.com to order your chamber today. Remember to tell them that Peter Schiff sent you to get 10% off. And that's a lot of money because these chambers aren't cheap. But if they work, they're worth 10 times what you pay. And if they don't, it's still worth a shot. I'm talking about Jerome Powell's uh, ridiculous comments that he uh, made to uh, questions asked of him uh, at his talk at the Economic Club of New York. And first off, I'm talking about while well, Powell's uh, misconception that economic growth is what causes inflation. And if he wants to lower the inflation rate, he just has to slow down the growth of the economy. And that's BS. Now, when Powell is talking about economic growth, he's talking about consumer spending. And he's looking at the spending numbers, retail sales uh, numbers, uh, GDP numbers, too, that are influenced by consumption, both by the government, too, and, and the, uh, the individual, because government's spending a lot of money, too. Uh, and, and a lot of the money that people are spending, they're getting from the government, right, in the form of uh, uh, checks. But that's not economic growth. That's just spending. That's not growing the economy. That's spending uh, what uh, a growing economy produces, except a lot of the growth is happening in Asia, in other countries, because we're spending on imports. And we're also borrowing money. Debt is at record highs. I mean, the reason that consumers are spending more is because they're paying more, number one. Right? Prices have gone way up, so everything costs more. And they're borrowing more to pay those higher prices. Now, some of the consumers, as I mentioned, have had to take on second and third jobs to pay those higher prices. So if you're just looking at the spending and you think, oh, we have this really strong economy. No, it's not a strong economy. You're looking at inflation. That's what's going on. Inflation is driving this spending. It's not a strong economy. And you don't need to weaken the economy to reduce inflation. You just have to reduce the spending. And how do you do that? Well, you know, much higher interest rates, much higher than we have, but the government has to cut back on spending. They, 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 they got to, you know, cut back on welfare spending or they even raise taxes and start paying down debt. But it's much better if they just cut government spending. But also, interest rates need to rise high enough so that people spend less of their paychecks. Again, we don't want people to stop working. No, if they stop working, they're not producing. That means there's less stuff. That puts upward pressure on prices. We want everybody to keep working. We just want them to stop spending everything they earn. They need to take some of their paychecks and save it, put it in the bank. But they're not gonna do that because the bank's not paying any interest. And even if you get interest, on a government bond by loaning your money to the government, which doesn't help the economy. When you put it in the bank, at least it could be loaned out to a businessman. But when you buy treasuries, you just, you know, you're, the money's going to the government. They're just blowing it on consumption. Um, but people aren't going to save when the interest rates are still not high enough to compensate you for inflation. So we don't want to weaken the economy. We want to weaken spending. But Powell doesn't know the difference. He thinks spending is the economy. He thinks that it's the consumer that drives the economy by spending money. I went over this last podcast. No, the, the consumer is the caboose. He's driven by the real engine of the economy, which is production. That's what we need more of. We need a stronger economy, but we need less spending, less consumption, more savings, more investment. None of that is happening. Powell doesn't understand that. So nothing that he's doing is going to be effective at bringing inflation down to 2%. Now, another thing that Powell did is he blamed today's inflation on the pandemic. He kept saying, well, it's the pandemic inflation, like everything was fine. And then this pandemic happened. And, and now we have to deal with the pandemic inflation. And it's just taking longer to just get rid of this you know, pandemic inflation. Again, the pandemic is not why we have inflation. The Fed is why we have inflation. Congress 
the president are why we have inflation. And not just Biden, but Trump and the presidents before him. They were all contributing to the inflation problem that we're dealing with today. Now, did we create even more inflation during COVID? Yes, we made the inflation problem worse, but it wasn't COVID. It wasn't the pandemic that did it. It was the government's response to the pandemic. That's what was the problem, not the pandemic. The pandemic was a health problem. But what the government did is turned it into an inflation problem (laughs) because they overreacted, number one. They forced people to stop working. And then they ran huge deficits to send people stimulus checks to buy stuff that they weren't making. The worst possible combination of monetary and fiscal policy ever devised. And I, I called them out on it in real time as they were making the mistakes, and I described exactly what was going to happen. In fact, I remember on my podcast when I called the peak of the bond bubble that started in 1980 when yields collapsed and you know the yields had a zero handle, like it was 0.6, 0.7 on a 10-year or 30-year. I said, that's it. This is done. The bond bull market is over. This is a blow-off top, and you know we're going much, much higher, and now we're at 5%. We're at the highest yield since 2007, and we're not even close to the end. We're going much, much higher than that. Uh, and, you know, that's part of this, you know, evolving uh, financial crisis. But, again, Powell doesn't understand where the inflation came from, if he's being honest. And so if he doesn't know why we have inflation, how is he going to get rid of it? Well, he's not. And if he's just lying about it, well, you can't trust anything that he says. Now, <clears throat> he got a question about the banks. Some, the guy asked them, and I forget who was asking these questions, but he asked them, you know, about the Silicon Valley bank failure. And he said, you know, are we out of the woods, right? Is, is, is the banking problem over? And he basically said, yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty much behind us. You know, we got that handled. <laughs> it's just starting. That was the tip of the iceberg. And what doesn't make sense is if you look at how much value has been lost uh, in mortgage-backed securities and treasuries since the um, March bailout of Silicon Valley Bank. It's been an enormous collapse. And so the banks today are in far worse shape than they were back in March when Silicon Valley Bank failed or was bailed out or everybody else was bailed out. And the Fed should know this because the Fed is the biggest loser of them all, because the Fed has more treasuries and mortgage-backed securities on its balance sheet than anybody else. So the Fed is the biggest loser, and somehow they think the crisis is behind us when it's all out in front of us, and it's about to be playing out uh, in front of their eyes. Now, I I can't imagine that he's he's this dumb. I mean, he's got to be just lying on that one. I mean, I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he's not a complete idiot, and he's just lying. Uh, Because, you know, like uh, Jack Nicholson, I mean, nobody can handle the truth because he knows this thing is being televised, right? He knows people are watching CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business. Everybody's, you know, got him up on television, you know, and he's not going to scare the bejesus out of the markets by telling the truth. (laughs) So so he's got a So he's got a a lie. Um, Let me get my next comment. Um, Oh, I'm. I know if I, yeah, you know, I, I thought this was interesting, too, is that they did talk about maybe there's not as much demand for treasuries out there. Yeah, that, 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 that's a, a massive understatement. Um, the, the Chinese, the Japanese, uh, everybody, I think, has been unloading uh, U.S. treasuries. I mean, they're major sellers, as is the Federal Reserve, which continues to shrink its uh, balance sheet. It's only a question of time, though, before until the dollar tanks. I mean, it hasn't really rallied recently, uh, but, you know, it's got to get killed because the main demand for dollars really is to buy treasuries. I mean, that's why people want dollars. It's not like they want to buy our products because they don't need them to buy our products. we got a huge trade deficit, right? So they got plenty of dollars to buy our products from selling us stuff that we didn't make, and they got lots of dollars left over. So what do they do with those dollars that they have left over? Well, they buy treasuries. Well, if they're not going to buy treasuries, what are they going to do with them? Well, nothing. Why keep them? Get rid of them. If you're not going to buy treasuries, which, you know, treasuries now really are one of the riskiest assets on the planet. I mean, look at how much they've gone down. I mean, look at that, you know, that TLT 
uh, security is down like 57% or something from its peak. People thought that was like a risk-free asset. I was warned for years about how risky uh, these treasury bonds were. And that thing has still got a long way to fall. I mean, it's pure risk. People were saying, oh, it's risk off. Let's buy treasuries. No, no, no. <laughs> you got plenty of risk when you own treasuries. If you want to take risk off, you got to sell treasuries. Well, then what do you buy when you sell treasuries? Aha, gold. And I'm going to talk about uh, what happened with gold when I finish dissecting uh, the, uh, the PAL, PAL comments. So I got to keep scrolling up on, uh, on this. And in fact, the backup in yields, the fact that the 30-year treasury is now above 5% and rising, what does that tell you? That tells you that the markets are losing confidence in the Fed's ability to keep in inflation at 2%. That's why the yields are rising. Of course, uh, Powell doesn't get that, and I'm going to get to that question uh, in a minute. I'm just trying to... Oh, so here's the next point I tweeted about. <laughs> I couldn't believe this. So Powell started talking about the risks of inflation being too low again. Right? He said that inflation can be too high or too low, and that both are risks. And he said that for a while, we had the problem of inflation being too low. And he said, now, you know, it's too high. But he's worried that at some point in the future, it's going to be too low again. And now he's going to have to deal with that problem. Like, that's a great problem to have because, A, it's not even a problem. But the consumer can use some relief. But low inflation was never a problem. That was a made-up problem so they can have an excuse to create more inflation. Now we've got a real problem of inflation being too high. Remember, it was in 2020 when Powell first introduced the concept of inflation averaging, where he said, you know, we don't have 2% as a target. We want inflation to average 2% over time because they wanted to justify letting inflation get to two and a quarter, two and a half. They didn't want to have to put on the brakes when we hit two. They wanted to make up for all the years where we were below two. So they redefined their target to an average inflation rate of 2%. Yeah, no one talks about that now. I mean, they haven't officially changed that. I mean, how many years are we going to have to have 1% inflation to average it down to 2? Because even the Fed doesn't claim it's going to get inflation down to 2% until uh, 2025. So that's like four or five years of inflation double, triple, quadruple 2. I mean, 1%, we need zero. We need falling prices to average back down to 2%. Of course, no, no, no. They're, they never want to do that. They only want to average up the low inflation. They never want to average down uh, the high inflation. So it's all a bunch of BS. Um, but here's one of the craziest things that he said. He was asked about the fiscal deficits, which are exploding, which are a huge problem, especially since he's raising interest rates and making those deficits harder to finance and bigger at the same time. So he was asked about it. And this is what Powell said. He said that he doesn't consider fiscal policy at all when he's making monetary policy. Like no one at the FOMC gives a damn. They don't even look at the federal budget. It's like some irrelevant thing that they don't even pay attention to. Right? We don't care what's happening. And he also said that they don't adjust their policy based on what's happening with fiscal policy. Like, it's got nothing to do with their mandate. When it has everything to do with their mandate, where's the inflation coming from? <laughs> it's coming from the budget deficits that he monetizes. And government spending is driving inflation. If you're trying to slow down the economy or just trying to cool consumption, if the government is increasing spending, that is counteracting what you're trying to do. How could you avoid that? How can you not care about that? In fact, the very reason the Fed is supposed to be independent is so it could push back against reckless fiscal policy. The Fed is supposed to be the chaperone here at this spending party. And if Congress is spending too much money, well, jack up rates. Make it harder for them to do that. Raise the cost of borrowing so that they cut back. It, it, it makes no sense. It's like a doctor saying, yeah, I don't pay any attention to the patient's symptoms. I just prescribe whatever the hell I feel like. I, I, and then I don't even watch the patient to see how it reacts.
to my prescription. Like, it's irrelevant, you know. I mean, the guy, the patient could die. And, well, I, I don't care about that. I'm just, you know, I'm just doing what I'm doing. I, I'm, not, I'm not looking. Or you're, you know, it, 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 none of this makes any sense. It's one of the most important things. If your responsibility is price stability, one of the most important things that you've got to consider is the fiscal uh, situation of the U.S. government. I mean, that's the debt. And if you're worried about a crisis, shouldn't you be worried about a debt crisis? Shouldn't you be worried? I mean, remember, I talked about it. Paul Volcker, when he actually won a fight against inflation, unlike Powell, who's losing, he criticized Congress all the time. He said, you got to cut spending. you got to reduce the deficit so we're never going to get rid of inflation. He was honest. Powell's a liar or he doesn't know what he's talking about. Of course, fiscal deficits matter. In fact, right now, they matter more than ever before. And Powell is clueless uh, about what's going on. All right, he really is like a Mr. Magoo. You know, I used to call Greenspan Mr. Magoo for all the stuff he was missing because he at least looked a little bit more like him. But, uh, but Powell is just, you know, walking around and there's accidents happening all around him. And he has got no idea what's going on. And to make it even worse, when he was asked about the backup in long-term interest rates, which, of course, is the biggest problem out there, right, what's happening with long-term interest rates. And the guy asked him, you know, why are they going up? And, of course, you know, Powell probably hasn't, has no idea. You know, he doesn't understand. But the first thing he said is, well, I'll tell you why they're not going up. He said they're not going up because of inflation. He says yields are not going up because bond investors are worried about higher inflation. <laughs> really? How does he know that? Seems like a very self-serving answer because his job is to fight inflation. He claims that he's doing a good job. So the first thing he says is, okay, well, I'll tell you one thing. The reason that those yields are not going up is because of inflation. It's got nothing to do with that. Well, you know, that's exactly why they're going up. That's the, in fact, maybe that's the reason he had to say that that's not where they're going up, because he wants to throw people off the track. Because, of course, that's why they're going up. People need to be compensated for higher inflation. Now, the funny thing about it is he admitted that part of the problem could be supply, right? He said, well, maybe that bond investors are worried about rising deficits or that there's going to be more treasuries on the market, and so maybe that could be causing higher yields. Yeah, but because that means more inflation. The bigger the budget deficits are, the more likely there is to be inflation. You see, Powell may not be paying attention to the budget deficits, but bond investors are finally paying attention to the budget deficits. They know that those budget deficits lead to more inflation. Powell apparently hasn't figured that out yet, or he's just lying about it. But I mean, that was probably going to be, you know, go down if you, you know, in history for his legacy of failure, you know, the what, how he fiddled while, you know, Rome burned, where he said, oh, yeah, we don't care. We don't care about the fiscal deficits. We don't worry about the national debt. We don't worry about the budget deficits. You know, there was a guy on CNBC today, uh, uh, Michael Boskin, uh, who is uh, the president of the Atlanta Fed. He's not voting right now, but he was on CNBC this morning. And I, I forget who was interviewing. Maybe it was Steve Leisman or whoever it was said something like, well, what about the, the fiscal situation in the United States? Do you think this is sustainable? I mean, we got these big deficits. We got the national debt. And so Boskin said, well, you know, eventually they won't be sustainable. He said at some point in the future, uh, as interest rates keep rising, these deficits won't be sustainable, and then Congress is going to have to start talking about it. You know, like the time to talk about it has long since passed. In fact, they needed to do something about it, and they didn't. That was the problem. They only talked about it, and they did nothing, and then they stopped talking. But to say that it's not sustainable until the future, when interest rates goes up, it's not sustainable right now because interest rates have already gone up. In fact, it was unsustainable before they went up because – we knew they were going to go up. To say it's not unsustainable until after they go up, again, I, I, I said this on the last podcast, if you jump off the top of the Empire State Building, you know, you're know you done. You can't say, it's well, it's not a problem until I hit the, the pavement. The minute you jumped, hitting the pavement is inevitable. So this problem has been there. It has been unsustainable for years. It's just that we were able to pretend that it wasn't 
because we can afford the interest, just like you can pretend you're okay, you know, assuming you stay alive for, for that fall from the top of the building uh, until, until you actually hit the pavement. Well, we're about to hit that pavement, right? So, you know, we're going we're gonna to suffer the consequences of this unsustainable deficit. In fact, we're seeing them right now. They're playing out before the blind eyes of our, our policymakers. Now, let me see. If I had some more comments from Pal, I forget what else. Um, I think yeah, so. I think I think that's it. I think those are all of my Pal tweets. There may have been some other uh, ridiculous comments that he made that I, I I didn't I didn't tweet about because you know it's, it's only so many so much time I have. Pretty much everything he said was wrong or or laughable or a lie. But anyway, I want to get to the market action. Uh, during the week, because the last four days of the week were particularly interesting. Forget about Monday, but from Tuesday through uh, Friday, the stock market was down every day. Now, the Dow, I think, on Monday was about flat, but the S&P and the NASDAQ uh, were down. But on Wednesday, the Dow dropped too. But pretty much the overall stock market dropped four days in a row as interest rates rose all of those days until today, right? and, and, and they, they hit new highs today, but we had a little bit of a rally. But the stock market was closed on the lows or close to the lows, uh, very ugly technical action. Those four days, the NASDAQ was down 4% during those four days, so average 1% per day. I mean, that's pretty big. I mean, if that continues, that, that adds up to, to a lot. The interesting thing about, about that is that while tech stocks are now reacting the way they should to rising bond yields, gold stopped acting the way it shouldn't and is now acting the way it should by going up. Gold was up every day for those four days. In fact, it was up about almost $60 over those four days. It closed the week at 19 81. Now, if you remember, two weeks ago today, I did a podcast. It was the Friday that we got the jobs report. Gold is $160 higher than the low from that Friday. And we almost hit 2,000 an ounce earlier this morning before we got some profit taking in gold. So I guess that round number, I think the futures got above 2,000. But the spot market, I think the high I saw was about 1997 before we backed off you know, to uh, 1981. But um, just based on where we closed, it's $160. But to the high, it was almost a $180 rally in, in two weeks. That tells me something. And you know, I think I was uh, pretty accurate in my call on that Friday that we had bottomed in gold because I really liked the one day uh, outside reversal day, which to me looked pretty strong. Plus I was looking for a bottom anyway, because I knew that everything that was going on uh, was very bullish for gold. And you know, the stuff that's happening in the Middle East, which unfortunately, as I said, is just getting progressively worse. Uh, and I expect that trend to continue, unfortunately. Uh, this is just adding uh, another bullish element to, to the gold story, which didn't need any more help, by the way. It was already going to go way up. Um, and oil, too. You know, oil continued to rise. Uh, it it, it um, didn't get above uh, 90. It was at like 89, 60, 89, 70. And then it had a little bit of a sell-off today. It closed at 88 a barrel. But oil prices continued to rise. I, I, I expect, again, a much bigger rise. The charts look great for oil and gold. And again, bond yields, too. They're all moving uh, in, in the same direction. But this is significant that we saw uh, this move up because gold is now breaking free of uh, this relationship it's had with bonds. Gold and bonds were falling together. Now gold is rising as bonds are falling. That is an important uh, missing piece to this puzzle which is in the process of being completed because gold is now taking over 
as the safe haven. Treasuries are a risk asset. They're not a safe haven. Again, what is the risk? Inflation. The risk is also the fiscal predicament of the United States, which causes more inflation. But if that is your risk, if you're worried about spiraling budget deficits and inflation, the last thing you'd want to do is buy treasuries. And so they're not a safe haven. What is a safe haven from inflation and a sovereign debt crisis? Gold. That's what investors are doing. They're buying gold. But even gold stock investors haven't figured this out yet because while gold was up uh, 3% in four days, gold stocks didn't move very much. The GDX was up like 1.7%. The GDXJ was up 2% during those four days. Normally, if gold was up 3%, actually it was up 3.2%, you would expect those stocks to be up double, maybe 7%. You know, on a move like that, uh, six and a half for the didn't happen. Why? Because gold is climbing a wall of worry. The investors who buy gold stocks don't believe the rally. They, you know, they've been they've seen this before. They've seen gold get up to two thousand, and it doesn't hold. Now, maybe some people think, well, it's all just about the Middle East. It's about Israel. It'll blow over. Well, first of all, the problem in Israel ain't blown over. It's going to be here for a long time. So even if that was the reason gold was rising, you know, it's going to be a long time before that situation is resolved. But that's not the reason. It's rising because of inflation. It's rising because of a loss of confidence uh, in the Fed and its ability to return inflation to 2%. A loss of confidence in the sustainability of the U.S. A fiscal situation that is spiraling out of control. Uh, so I do think that we're going to break through that 2000 resistance, but then I think gold is going to break through to uh, new highs because if rising interest rates aren't going to hurt gold, then that's it. There's nothing left. And it was the rising interest rates that were also pushing up the dollar. The dollar hasn't started to fall, but it ain't going up anymore. It didn't really gain any ground this week on the um, the rise in bond yields. In fact, let me look at the, the dollar index on the week, and it actually declined on the week. So that's another good sign. Gold was up, shrugged off rising rates. The dollar declined, shrugged off uh, rising rates. So this, again, brings us closer to this crashing dollar, uh, uh, crashing bonds, uh, rising gold that brings us much, much closer to this financial crisis kicking in to a, a higher gear. As I said, we just started, it's early in the crisis, but it is going to continue to get worse. Now, I got a comment, too, to close off the podcast on Bitcoin, because people are going to say, Peter, why are you talking about gold? Look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin was way up. Bitcoin actually got above 30000 today, this morning. That's the highest it's been in a long time. Let me see where it is right now as I am recording this uh, this podcast. I know it didn't hold thirty thousand. Uh, yeah, twenty nine thousand six hundred and change. But you know, it's it's close enough, right? It, it had a strong day, stronger than gold, stronger week than gold. But it didn't rise for the same reason. It didn't r- rise because of safe haven. It rose because speculators are betting on an ETF. In particular, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust now filed to convert to an ETF. This is something that Schoenstein, or I forget whoever the guys, uh, I debated that guy, Barry. Um, uh, there's two guys, I forget their names, but that, that run uh, a, a grayscale. Um, but they've been trying to get this uh, ETF for, for years. Of course, it's the worst thing that can happen to their business model because they charge a 2% management fee. And, and so that's, that's huge, just to, just to babysit your Bitcoin. But their AUM is going to collapse once this thing goes to a, uh, a, a, an ETF. And, of course, when it is an ETF, they're not even going to be able to charge 2% management fees anymore because no one's going to, going to keep their money there. They're going to take it out if they, a, a, and go to another ETF that charges less. The reason they couldn't do that before was a closed-end fund. But a lot of people bought the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. The discount got to almost 50%. 
So you could buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin for 50 cents. Now, of course, a dollar's worth of Bitcoin is worth nothing. So you bought nothing for 50 cents. But at least market-wise, what was trading in the market at a dollar, you could buy for 50 cents. I think that the, the discount now is narrowed all the way back to about 12. But remember, for years, it was trading at a 20, 30 percent premium, right, But before it crashed. But a lot of people were buying the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust waiting for it to become an ETF so that the discount would go away. And now they're going to sell. So what's going to happen when this thing is finally an ETF? All the people who were buying it, hoping it would become an ETF, are going to sell. The trade is done. They made their money. They won. Now it's time to ring the cash register and sell. And so what does that mean? That means that all these Bitcoin, and there's like, based on today's price, I don't know, 13, 14 billion dollars, worth of Bitcoin that have been locked up in this trust for years, right? It was a roach motel for Bitcoin. They check in, but they can't check out. Well, now all the roaches can get out because now people can get their money back. Before, you could sell your shares, but you had to sell to another buyer. And that's why there was a discount. But now you could just get your money back. But how does Grayscale give you your money back? They got to take the Bitcoin that they've got, sell them to get the cash to give people their money. So I think that there is going to be a wave of Bitcoin selling when uh, this thing becomes an ETF. Everybody thinks that, no, 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 there's a, all these people are just waiting to buy the ETF. Like for some reason, they don't want to buy now. They want to wait till there's an ETF and then buy. No, I think people are waiting for an ETF to sell. You know, it's buy the rumor, sell the fact. It's not buy the rumor and buy more on the fact. In fact, they may start selling on the rumor of the fact. I mean, this thing could collapse any day. Uh, because I think a lot of the people who are waiting to ring that cash register are not going to get as much money out of this trade as they think, because I think we're going to start the collapse in Bitcoin and uh, Grayscale, because once Bitcoin starts going down, it's going to drag down the, 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 uh, the, the uh, Grayscale trust before it actually happens. I think so the smart money is not waiting to sell on the news. They're selling now on the rumor of the news. Anyway, that's it for today's podcast. Uh, again, let me remind everybody, if you stuck around for 57 minutes, you must like the content. So don't forget to hit that like button. Uh, subscribe to this channel. Uh, leave me a comment. You know, I, I want to let everybody know, too, because I, I teased about this some time ago. But um, we're having a big party here at my house uh, tomorrow night. I can still hear the music outside the studio. We're doing some rehearsals. We got about 400 people coming over to my house for a, uh, a Halloween party. But uh, one thing that's special about the party, well, there are actually a number of things, but particularly to me, is my wife is making her debut with her new band. I, I, I talked about this at one point in the podcast, and, and soon I think we're going to have her music uh, out there where you guys can you know, get it on iTunes or wherever people post their music. But uh, she partnered up with a guy named Tony Fratinelli, who uh, was the original guitarist for Third Eye Blind, who happened to be a big Peter Schiff fan, and that's how he reached out to me. But then he kind of hooked up you know, with my wife uh, as, uh, on collaborating uh, on some music. And, and so they have about a dozen songs now that they've written, original music. So if, uh, Tony uh, composes the music, and my wife... Uh, uh, you know, wrote the lyrics and, and is the vocal. And it's a two-man or a man and a woman group. They call themselves uh, the Laughing Cats. So they're going to make their debut. Uh, they're going to be performing a number of their original songs uh, live at this party. So uh, once it's out, I'll be sharing the, the, uh, the music with everybody, and you can hopefully enjoy it. I think it's, I think it's good stuff. It's very popular uh, music. It's catchy. So I think it, it, you know, it, could, it could do well. Uh, and um, if you want to see some, some uh, images of this party, I'm sure she's going to put everything up on her uh, Instagram page. So if you look, if you, look if you have to you know, figure out who, you know, who my wife is, but she's up there. <laughs> she's on uh, Instagram. So hopefully uh, she does a great job. I'm very proud of her and the work that she's put in uh, to this performance and all of these songs that she's uh, worked so hard uh, to create. And now she's going to perform them for a live audience for the first time. Anyway, have a great weekend, everybody. And I will be uh, back again with more podcasts as this financial crisis continues to unfold 
uh, in, 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 in a way that nobody but us seems to, uh, seems to be able to uh, see it. But eventually, what we can see will be obvious to the rest of the world. But by then, of course, it will be too late for them to do anything about it. But for my audience, it's not too late. You still have time. Uh, so buy your gold. Get your uh, financial house in order uh, before the whole house comes tumbling down. Bye for now. Thank you.